I start to let out and ask him what was the problem, who said I want your car? I do a videotape reenactment. Sitting in the car is Elizabeth Diane And I Bounds. said, she ought to be kidding. I mean, how many people really do that in real life? They don't. I just kept saying, God, do what's that? You know, if they gotta die, let them die, but don't let them die. Blood, all the pain. Emotionally, she was flat. I kept trying to tell that she was too smart for us and that there wasn't anything that could trip her up. And on October 13th, I just went and got pregnant because I was so lonely. I love my children. I miss my children. And, and I know that sounds simplistic. It really does. And I have to admit that. And that's why I say there's so much more feeling inside than I can give in two minutes. For my mother, whole life. Who? shot you my mom yeah. why wouldn't they arrest me if I did it if they really had this evidence I say they didn't have the evidence even though the sun had already set over Springfield Oregon's lush hills the heat on May 19 1983 stayed the same as it had during the day there was a strange stillness to the evening like the kind you find before a storm. In a Pop Sugar ad, she looked like a cover model, with flawless skin and a wide smile, like a Cosmo model. But behind the charming exterior, is an evil killer. You cannot deny it. The heartless mother shot her kids because the married man she was dating, was against kids. A mommy murderess shot her three kids because of her fading, unreal love. However, God wants to punish her. So he took all the love from her heart. And now, the soul is racked with anger, fear, and perhaps regret for the rest of her sinful life. It's true, some stories stay with you forever. No matter how much they hurt or anger you, the pain will always be fresh in your mind. One of those cases is the case of Diane Downs and her three kids. A horrible tragedy. Unexplained evil act. A selfish, hollow, and truly evil woman. A mother who has no room in her heart, for her sweet, innocent children. Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson, was born on August 7, 1955, in Phoenix, Arizona. She claims that as a child, her father molested her in the presence of her mother. Diane was an intelligent student, but never one of the popular kids at school. Due to their strict, old-school Baptist upbringing, which included banning modern clothing and fads, their daughter was considered a washout. She was always the outcast, the square, or the awkward duckling wherever she walked. When she was 14, her dad let her go to charm school. With that came a new Diane, who got her hair cut in a trendy style and updated her wardrobe to reflect current trends. Diane, who was starving for love by this time, responded by playing the part of the babe with sparkling eyes, swaying hips, and a silly giggle. One of the male students at Moon Valley High School, Stephen Downs, fell head over heels in love with the lovely and suddenly curvy blonde, Diane, almost immediately. The duo became an item and roved together, everywhere they went, arm in arm. They went their separate ways after graduation, he to the Navy and she to Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College. If Diane had promised to store it for Steve, she had weakened. A year later, Diane was expelled for promiscuity, and went home. Despite Steve's joining the Navy, they seemed destined to be together. After high school, the two reunited and rekindled their love. It's just that Diane's parents disapproved of the relationship, as they had high hopes for their daughter's future, which Steve didn't share. Despite that, Steve and Diane got married in November 1973. At 18, Diane had run away from home to get married. Their marriage wasn't as great as they expected. Steve was an immature and irresponsible player, and it was hard for the couple to make ends meet, they constantly argued over each other's cheating. Despite their reservations, they chose to stay together and had their first child, Christiane, in 1974. Their second child, Cheryl Lynn, was born in 1976, followed by Steve and Donyal in 1979. 
and after seven years of marriage, many people have wondered why the two decided to part ways. As it turns out, the couple's third child, a son, was born out of his wife's relationship with his colleague. By the time Danny was born, Steve and his wife had intense arguments about the infidelity. Steve was convinced that Danny was not his biological son. All this was on top of the divorce, and the tough time the kids were walking through. Diane, too, was ignorant of her children and often left them with her parents. She was especially cruel to Cheryl, who confided to a neighbor that she was afraid of her mother. Between 1976 and 1977, Diane took Steve's children and attempted multiple times to flee the household, but she ultimately returned. But after they were brought back together, it was like starting the game again. No matter how unhappy he and she were, their marriage ended. Diane was hostile yet passive. She was angry and bored in the same breath. Her life was moving too fast, and none of the things she promised herself had happened. In 1978, the family had already settled into their new home in Mesa, Arizona, where Steve and Diane were employed by the same mobile home manufacturer. Diane found her stud while working on the assembly line, and she proceeded to ardently seduce him. Her stomach swelled, and she felt as if she were floating in a wonderland while high on love. Danny was born in 1979, four days after Christmas. Steve took the boy in and raised him as his own, even though the child was not his. Still, the marriage had reached its ebb, and, within a year, the Downs decided to split. Diane moved in with Danny's father, and she began to alter around this time. The woman seemed to forego her motherly duties. Now, she was free of the wifely manacles imposed by society and the Baptists. The euphoria brought on by the affection of her children had worn off. She liked to work, stay away from home, and leave the kids with whatever babysitter she could find. Diane put everything before those kids. If Danny wanted attention, she would push him away. For Diane, it was more about men's affection. In 1981, Diane got a full-time job with the U.S. Post Office, and was assigned to Chandler for most of her career. There, she became acquainted with Robert Nick, a married man, and fell in love with him. On the other hand, for a change, the other person, and not Diane, decided when and where the love affair would end. Unfortunately, Nick didn't want to babysit Diane's kids, nor did Diane. Her lover physically left her life, just as she had emotionally distanced herself from her own children. But she could not fully accept the reality that she couldn't have things her way this time. As she was caught off guard, she concocted a horrible fate for her kids just to get back into her affair. Diane simply wanted to get rid of her kids, so she could have time to love herself. Diane needed to look in the dark when there was no hope in the light. She was totally devastated. But no matter how much she loved this person, it was impossible to think about killing her child. Yet the mother endured the unbearable. On May 19, 1983, along a rural road near Springfield, Diane got out of the car, pulled out a handgun, and then returned to her seat after she got out of the car. She pulled the trigger after pointing the gun at Cheryl. Then she turned back to the other two sleeping kids only that they were not sleeping. They've been awakened by Cheryl's screams and the shooting. In the same way, Diane shot her other two kids and then shot herself. Having cleaned up the crime scene and gotten rid of the weapon, maybe for half an hour, she drove bloodied handed to the hospital. At around 10.48 p.m., nothing could have prepared the emergency unit for the drama right outside their house. It wasn't until a red Nissan sped into the emergency drop-off area, and honked its horn, hoping to scare away the demons. Everyone on the night shift heard it, and their looks told them immediately. A blonde woman in her twenties stood just outside the automated doors and waved them through. Apparently, all she could say was, my kids just got shot. When doctors glanced out the Nissan window, they became unsteady on their feet. The side panels were covered in blood, and inside the blood were the bodies of three young kids. One of the youngsters was in the front passenger seat, and the other two were in the back. 
At first sight, the nurses could tell that the shots had been fired reasonably close to the kids. The hospital's top surgeon led a SWAT-like team of white-coated professionals to assist in the emergency room. When the three injured kids were brought in by sobbing nurses and pale interns. While reinforcements were on their way, doctors explained the situation briefly by saying, chest wounds. Two of the children could continue breathing, albeit laboriously, while the third child was only able to gasp for air. Cheryl, who was found slumped in the front seat, appeared to be beyond saving, despite the physician's heroic efforts on the operating table, the damage had been fatal. Just minutes after arriving at the hospital, a doctor pronounced Cheryl dead. Even though Diane was present at the moment, the medics didn't find out the children's names and ages until much later. However, the children's names and ages didn't matter yet. In fact, they were the least relevant factor in this hour, this night, and this catastrophe. The fact that a heartless cold-blooded mom had planned to kill her three children really made it clear what was important. Even though fate seemed to be against them, the caretakers acted quickly to ensure fate was kept at bay and beat it at its own game. Stephen and Christy required surgery, and were attended to by professionals. They felt the children would die from significant blood loss and the lack of oxygen. They performed tracheotomies to get rid of the blood clotting their throats and save as much air as possible. The other organs were also brought back to life as the machines began to pump the tiny hearts. Despite the kids' fragile condition, the heroic doctors kept them alive and breathing. Everyone had only one wild question on their mind. Who in the name of God could have aimed a pistol at three small children's chests and pulled the trigger? While he only shot the woman in her shoulder. Diane, their evil mother, did not provide an answer to the question. She told the hospital receptionist that she and her family had been driving home from seeing a friend when a man, a busy-haired stranger, flagged down their car. Luckily, Springfield Police and the Lane County Sheriff's Office responded. That's when Diane insisted on telling them about the ambush and her strange description of the wanderer. Nurses were tending to her arm when he arrived. It had a series of minor, superficial wounds between the elbow and the wrist where she had fended off the gunman's blows. Diane had suffered only minor injuries, and she appeared to be in an unusually calm state. Actually, she seemed to be in complete control of her senses. So, a detective asked her to accompany him so she could pinpoint the crime scene. It was a very lonely spot where the river rushed past in the dark on one side, and on the other, wild fox trembled in the wind. Dad just hit my cat! Started the car, and left. The car door shut itself. We were just out, I guess, sightseeing, I guess you'd say. And the kids got tired, they fell asleep in the car, so I decided to just head on home. But I saw a road I hadn't been on before, we liked to take back roads, and just went down that road, and there was a guy standing in the road, flagging me down, so I stopped. Everything was done in a matter of five or 10 seconds. He swung himself around and fired twice. One caught me in the arm, the other one I went off somewhere. Danny cried the whole way. I could hear him softly just moaning, and Christy was dying. God, the, all the blood. I kept trying to tell Detached. her to roll over so she wouldn't choke on the blood, and it didn't dawn on me at the time that the blood was coming from her lungs. Her behavior was not anything that you would expect for uh, a mother who'd gone through this. And as I say, she may be the only one to get me out of this. Would I have brought her to the hospital? Wouldn't she be the one that I would make sure is dead? There are too many holes in This was not the right place for a young mom with three kids to talk to strangers. It was near the intersection of two rural roads, and the detective couldn't just swallow the story. When Diane arrived back at the hospital, the medical staff informed her of the critical condition of her third child, Cheryl, and the conditions of her first two children. She calmly accepted the information, but the staff anticipated that she would lose it. They were surprised by her demeanor, because she appeared to be too accepting. Diane responded almost puzzledly when she was told that Danny had a chance of surviving. Then, shockingly, 
she asked the nurse how the bullet missed his heart. And then she, the mother, laughed and said, only the best for my kids. And she laughed again and said, well, I have good insurance. The detectives who had a private conversation with her were also taken aback by how she carried herself. One of the investigators, a smart and quick-witted veteran, observed that she was unlike previous ladies he had met after situations of a similar nature. Diane was too stoic for a mother whose entire brood was just shot. At that point, detectives determined that the bullets fired were 22 calibers, either from a handgun or rifle, and the gun was the prime suspect. As a result, the powder burns on the kid's skin, suggesting the angry weapon was shot from an unusually close range. This was true for the burns found on Cheryl, who had been sitting in the front seat. Blood splattered across the car's doors, seats, and windows, as well as other surfaces, provided evidence that the killer, had fired the gun from the vehicle's left, or driver's side. This corroborated Diane's account, claiming the intruder had entered the car through her window. As for the mother, Diane provided her Danny's interrogators gonna walk again. with a I don't care if you just have to will him to walk. I think he's going to walk. The doctors all say he won't. But I know that your mind controls your body, and if I can love him enough and encourage him enough, I believe he'll walk. He did not take time to point the gun and shoot me, obviously, because he would have shot me the same way he did the kids. When he was swinging in the direction of the keys firing the gun, he hit my arm. Everybody says you sure were lucky. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. It is very painful. It is still painful. The scar is going to be there forever. I'm going to remember that night for the rest of my life, whether I want to or not. I don't think I was very lucky. I think my kids were. Please arrest me so that I can prove I'm innocent so my kids can come home and they wouldn't. If I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. While Diane was talking, the detective's mind wandered for a little bit. He had read the doctor's report on Diane's arm injury, which stated that a single bullet entered her left forearm, leaving two small wounds. When she told him how she escaped the man on the road and was shot in the arm, he couldn't help but think that the exact spot is where other killers have shot themselves to look like they were attacked. But he didn't and wouldn't, reserve judgment until all of the evidence is presented. And that wouldn't happen for quite some time. Before the interview was over, Diane gave her consent for a search warrant to be executed at her residence. She stated that she possessed a handgun for protection on her delivery route, and a rifle for home safety. Still, neither of these weapons was ever used. While one was left out in the cold in her trunk, the other gathered dust on the shelf. During this time, officers stationed around the hospital were extremely active. They prepped the red Nissan to be transported to the crime lab, where further investigation would occur. While they did this in the house's driveway, other detectives took photographs of the injuries sustained by the murdered girl when they were in the morgue. The more the mother told, the more suspicious her story became. Over the next few days, her story changed a little bit. She also acted differently depending on who told the story about the alleged shooter. This also applied to where the murderer, was when he shot her. To solve this puzzling, annoying, and heartbreaking mystery. Everyone assigned to this homicide knew without a shadow of a doubt that the weekend was filled with knocking on doors, asking questions, and rattling brain cells. Since a gunman had brutally blown apart the bodies of three defenseless toddlers, the police officers didn't mind working overtime. It wasn't an intentional lie though, I didn't sit there. But you changed your there. story. Oh yeah, yeah. I I agree. I mean, you know, you've heard it. It's obvious. Doesn't that make it seem kind of tough to believe what you're saying? If you change your story two months after the shooting? I, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not saying that you have to believe me. I'm not saying that anybody has to believe me. But I know within myself, I can sit here with a clear conscience and know that I did not shoot my kids. After Diane Downs was finally allowed into the intensive care unit to visit Christy, one of her two surviving children, several nurses, and an investigator stood by the bedside. Seeing her mother approaching. 
Christie's eyes took on a fearful glaze as she looked up at her oxygen mask. As she squeezed her daughter's hand and whispered, I love you. Those watching her saw that her gesture was cold and emotionless. As if she was gritting her teeth, she said what she said. At the very beginning. Okay, no reason in your mind. And I have one man sitting here looking at me with a face of stone. I have another man over there smoking a cigarette, 90 miles an hour, and tasting. You're not my best buddies, I wouldn't go drinking with you, that's for sure. Do you feel guilty about what you did, Diane? No, because I didn't do anything wrong. And I wouldn't change it if I could. My kids and I always took the back roads. Try and find out who shot your kids. And, if it was and you, I'm doing what I can. Fine, I, mean, I agree. You, you're going to take the fall for it. If it I wasn't agree. you, then uh, I'm going to quit this job. During a search of Diane's Springfield home, state troopers found a diary, the rifle, and a box with standard 22 caliber shells. The same ones are located on the children's bodies. The detectives were also intrigued when they saw a young man's picture on top of Diane's. They also knew Diane had called a man in Arizona, supposedly her ex-boyfriend, shortly after she got to the hospital. When she wasn't even sure where her children were, and before she contacted the father of her children, she called this Arizona man. While staring at the picture, the detectives couldn't help but wonder if they were looking at the person who was the subject of Diane's urgent phone call. Maybe that is the trigger for this tragedy. By then, detectives thought of another trick, but they had to play smart. They started looking at the two young kids, who were confused and terrified. Even they were taken aback when they found their eyes welling up with tears. As they looked at each other, Christy and Danny, lay in a dimly lit hospital room connected to tubes and cords for the rest of their lives. In addition to Christy's reaction when she saw her mother for the first time since the shooting. They knew it wasn't normal for a kid in pain and surrounded by unfamiliar faces to rejoice at seeing the one person who could lift their spirits. Detectives also found Steve Downs to be an open, frank talker who was relieved to be rid of his ex-wife. Although they were still friends, their sporadic phone conversations never went beyond the kid's well-being regarding their health and grades. Unlike his ex-wife, Steve was really distressed by the awful news, and he was seen to have a fatherly optimism that Christy and Danny would pull through. He didn't waste any time and arranged to go to Oregon to see them. Detectives then asked Steve Downs if he knew who the Arizona man might be. Steve was not surprised by the question. He said, you mean the man who, judging by the tone of the pages, had abandoned her. The man with whom Diane was having an affair before leaving Arizona. At that time of year, in the spring, the river churned here and ran a rapid course, and experts determined that if the gun had been thrown into the river, it would have been flushed miles away on the current. However, ejected casings from a 22 caliber were discovered in the area, matching those found in the automobile. Searching the area surrounding the crime scene was unsuccessful in locating the murder weapon. Divers even plunged into the Mohawk River that runs through the topography but could not find the gun. By then, they were worried that the court wouldn't have much of a case against Diane Downs without the murder weapon. They waded along the river, turned over loose stones, and kicked through the reed grass to upturn loose soil, but they did not find anything. There was no weapon to punish Diane. And it's possible that the lone living witness to the homicide, the murderer's own daughter, wouldn't be able to implicate her mother in the crime. It was, however, the news that crushed their spirits. Christie had suffered a stroke, and doctors warned them, she might not be able to speak again. The left side of the brain, the part that governed the ability to speak, had been wounded. But, there was optimism, albeit slight. Doctors prayed that, because she was so young, they could reverse the damage with therapy and recover her slurred tongue. Even though they had their doubts, they just couldn't shake the feeling that her fixation on her ex-boyfriend, was what drove her to point the gun at her own children. Even so, if they are true and the evil mother did the unthinkable, they need to stop her, because the man's wife will surely be the next victim. Before the weekend was over, two investigators traveled to Chandler, Arizona, to learn more about the man who haunted her sleepless nights. You were pregnant at trial, why did you get pregnant again? 
I was extremely lonely. I missed my kids desperately. I had just seen Christy on the 2nd of October. And it just, it's like opening a wound and pouring salt in. I was extremely lonely, beyond belief and beyond explanation. May 23rd was a depressing week, but there was also hope. On the 25th, the funeral for Cheryl Downs took place. The Mackenzie Willamette Hospital, however, reported that both Christy and Danny were out of immediate danger, which was a welcome piece of news. Danny would probably be crippled for the rest of his life, but his brain had not been affected in any way, and he would live. One of Christy's arms was paralyzed, and her speech was garbled for the time being. Meanwhile, two detectives in Arizona, using their professional expertise to investigate Diane Downs' history. It was a very productive trip, they got all the info they needed about Diane Downs, their primary suspect. They began by determining that neither Steve Downs, nor the unidentified man from Arizona, were the bushy-haired stranger, Diane had mentioned. Even though Diane's ex-lover used to work at the Chandler station, the investigators decided to conduct their interview with him separately, at his house. To his credit, they liked him because they appreciated his honesty and openness. While honestly talking about his sexual encounters with his former love interest, he insisted that his wife was at his side at all times. He stated that his wife was aware of the situation but had forgiven him. After they had discussed things and decided to get back together, he cut all ties with Diane. He made several attempts to prevent them from seeing each other, but Diane faced fierce resistance each time. He stated, the affair raged on and continued, and he was with Diane all day at work, and he'd be with her all night long, and it was every day for months. Basically, he didn't have time to think, and the affair continued and intensified. However, detectives noticed that Diane's ex-lover suggested the Downs children were getting in the way of their mother's love life. Despite her protests, he ignored that she was in the company of Danny, Christy, and Cheryl. He told her he wouldn't be with her if the children were present. It was an affair, it didn't seem more than that. After struggling with guilt for many months, the man decided to end his relationship with Diane. In February 1983, after constant complaints from his girlfriend, he cut off communication. So Diane reached out one last time and asked him who he loved more, himself or his wife. And when he told her he loved his wife, she ranted, shouted, and screamed at him in a way that he had never seen anyone do. When he hurried home, Diane followed him, even up the steps of his own home with his wife present. The wife says she knocked on their door all night. After that, she called, but the next day she showed up on her porch and confronted her. The event was what the wife's husband referred to as the last straw, and he never saw her again after that. Diane submitted her transfer request to the Oregon location shortly after that night. She moved to Springfield so that she could be closer to her parents. But the letters and phone calls to her former boyfriend kept coming even after they broke up. Detectives left Arizona with every bit of information they wanted to hear. And in June, the assistant district attorney convened a meeting with his investigative team to discuss the discoveries that had been uncovered. Even though they were convinced, she had committed the crime. Since detectives didn't have a murder weapon or a credible eyewitness, they feared their evidence would be circumstantial. One of the evidence came from a forensic expert, said it's likely that some of the unfired shells in Diane's home were from the same gun that shot the kids. But they also know the court can challenge this claim until the gun is located and brought back. Other pleasant things were taking place at the same time. The county judge placed the two surviving Downs kids in the protective custody of the state's Child Services Bureau. Because of this, Diane was not permitted to visit her children while the situation was being resolved. Still confined to his bed, Danny was given complete protection by the police until he was medically released. Once 1984 rolled around, Diane was on her way to becoming the media's favorite celebrity. Most mediums trusted her, but some distrusted her because she couldn't find the bushy-haired beast of mythology. Because she looked a little like Princess Diana, she became the darling fashion plate of the American Pacific Coast. On the other hand, detectives did not consider her to be a princess in any way. She was more like an evil witch, wreaking havoc on everyone. 
Finally, Diane Downs called for what she hoped would become a peace treaty. This was a meeting with the two detectives to explain her side of the story. She also passed on further information she had not divulged since the night of the attack. Initially, the investigators thought this new insight might provide something groundbreaking. But, recognizing they were being fooled, the session led to what would become known as the hardball interview. And when they asked her straight out if she had attempted to kill her children because they ruined her chances with her lover, she also had an answer. She insulted them, threatened them, and said they were messed up. She even threatened to kill them and stormed out of the room. Come on, Diane. It's your turn at that. Since you guys seem to think that I should have brought Diane with me, I'll be doing myself. Because I know who did it. You do know who did it? Yes, I do. I damn sure do. You know him by yes, name? I do. Yes, I do. Yes. You saw him shoot your kids? Yep. It's pretty important. And I saw him grab my arm and yank my arm out and shoot my arm and say, now try to get away with it. And I'm leaving because I know who did it. Bye. Writing. I'll make you a deal, okay? Next time I remember something, yeah. You can find it down yourself because I know I didn't do it. And you can chase your little tails for the next 20,000 years if that's what it takes. You you're don't real, like my health, you can f*** it. You're real confident in yourself, aren't you? I know that I didn't do it. Whether or not it was a ploy for compassion, just in case Diane needed some in the aftermath of a jury trial, or whether she really needed to feel that love once again within her. She ventured out. She got pregnant, once again, with one of her favorite studs. A TV reporter asked her why she got pregnant. Because I miss Christy, and I miss Danny, and I miss Cheryl so much. I'm never going to see Cheryl on Earth again. And I just, you can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. And they give me love, they give me satisfaction, they give me stability, they give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy, and, and that's gone, they took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. Those were Diane's exact words. Detectives sneered as they watched her performance on the tube, thinking it might get her off death row. In the meantime, Christie's therapist, who was supposed to deal with her nightmares, was making significant headway. The child began to talk, to remember, to face reality. While avoiding the murder topic for a long time, she talked to Christy about her life and her mother. Diane indeed slapped Christy, her brother, and her sister many times. And when the day came, the therapist asked her to recount what happened the night of what Christy called that dreadful thing. Christy started to say, I believe, but couldn't finish. The detectives knew they had to take the risk, had sufficient evidence, and believed that the case would be successful. However, they'd need to recreate that terrible thing in court so the jury sees what they saw and believes what they witnessed. They had spoken to, questioned, and debated the words of many people, including Diane Downs. After nine months, they weighed the mountains of testimony they had. An indictment was brought against the mother, which included one count of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of criminal assault. The state of Oregon was closing in for the kill with the alleged child killer. When Diane got out of her car in the post office parking area on February 28, 1984, the cops handcuffed her as she walked toward the entrance. Reporters were there by the droves, drooling over the battle that was to come. Their newspapers already reported that an evil actress mother had been arrested. And that maybe she was the murderess after all. Wes Fredrickson, Diane's father, said, If my daughter did it, then I believe, in fact, she should pay. But nothing can take away the love a father has for his kids. The truth is, you never know if you're a monster until you're one. In light of the imminent court proceeding, Diane sought the advice of Melvin Belly, a highly regarded and clever attorney. Diane Downs' case received considerable media attention, so Belly was interested in representing her. He would defend Diane only if the trial could be postponed a couple of months after the already scheduled May 1984 date. But the courts refused to budge. Delaying it would mean waiting for it again for Diane, who was pregnant. This had already been delayed too long, and much work had been wasted. Diane was forced to find another lawyer quickly. She chose criminal attorney Jim Jagger, 
a man noted for his down-home but effective manner. What was to be a six-week trial opened on May 10, 1984, in Eugene at the Lane County Courthouse, the largest of the rooms of justice in the old building. The country turned out for the thrill, people across America were still divided over Diane Downs' guilt or innocence. Was she a martyr, or a devil? Her motivation was love for the married man, who felt that her children should not be a part of their fantasy life. Screaming her love, for a man who didn't want her as much as she desired him. Afterwards, the detectives read Diane's masturbation poetry aloud to the court's delight. Her attorney conceded that there had been an obsession, but it was not so dark to destroy the three kids she loved the most, even more than her lover. He brought up her past, the alleged sexual abuse she suffered as a kid, and even her promiscuity. He viewed these details as having some connection to her dysfunctional experience. But, a murderess. No, he was even trying to prove Diane's story on the Mohawk Road was not a falsehood. Throughout the trial, witnesses came and went, each making an impact, some more than others. But, the high point, the turning point, came when Christy Downs was brought to the stand. Detectives helped her to the stand as she trembled and wiped away tears. It was clear that they detested the moment, which consisted of bringing a child face to face with her mother, her killer. The moment was needed for American justice to be played out. Generally, after her eyes and mother temporarily met, they didn't rush her, and she stayed calm. The atmosphere in the courtroom seemed to take a deep breath and then hold it until the proceeding was over. Giving her time to relax, and her voice to become suitably audible in the courtroom, he then asked her some basic questions about her family and schooling. Feeling that she was ready for the heavy stuff, he maneuvered into the day of the crime. The child caved in under her tears, and the detective hugged her. He knew this must come and wanted to get it over with, so he gave her time to find her voice again. After that sad moment, the tone for the rest of the trial was set. Diane Downs was guilty of all the sins of the world. Americans who refused to believe a mother could shoot three innocent kids surrendered outside the courtroom, too. It was just that they thought the cross was being nailed together for a martyr, but it turned out to be an instrument of deserved justice. On June 14, 1984, Judge Foote announced the verdict that had been reached by the jury. Guilty of first-degree attempted murder, a second count of first-degree attempted murder, and two counts of first-degree assault. Oregon, at the time, did not impose the death sentence. Still, in the subsequent sentencing, the judge sought to permanently deprive Diane Downs of the daylight of liberty. After decreeing a life term and an additional 50 years for using a firearm, he said, the court hopes the defendant will never again be free. I've gotten as near to achieving that goal as I possibly can. While the court was in the break between the verdict and the sentencing, Diane gave birth to a beautiful child, whom she called Amy. The child's biological father denied having any relationship with Diane, and Amy was eventually adopted by a loving family. While Diane Downs's story is far from over, there's still much more to uncover. When Diane was convicted, Christy was adopted by the prosecutor and his wife. She was the star witness at her mom's trial, and her testimony helped convict her. When the police figured out all the details, Steve Downs discovered what happened. After a few weeks, Steve's kids were placed in protective custody. They've both finished their education. Danny, a computer genius, is still partially paralyzed from the bullet in his back, but he lives an everyday life. Christy is now in her 40s and has a speech impediment. She studied at the University of Oregon and now lives in town with her family. She had her first baby, a boy, in 2005 and then a girl named Cheryl, after her sister. As for Danny, he's kept his private life a secret. Perhaps he is going about his daily routine. Still, details about his personal life, like his marriage and kids, remain a mystery. Diane, however, wanted more action and a camera in her life. On July 11, 1987, Diane was caught scaling a 15-foot high chain-link fence surrounding a women's prison while guards weren't looking. Before jumping to freedom, she wore clothes to protect herself from the barbed wire on top of the fence. 
The notorious female jailbird had somehow gotten over the wall and escaped. Despite a lack of leads and a flood of tips stretching as far as Wisconsin, it would take authorities 10 days to find Downs. She was just a few blocks away from Cypher's house. Although Wayne Cypher and his wife were separated, he didn't stop her from sending another inmate to his house unannounced. I wanted revenge at that time. I, I wanted to do some really obscene things to his body. In the meantime, Diane was shacking up with Cypher, who was living with his two friends in the house. Upon showing up, Cypher was hungover, and Bob came up to his room to tell him someone wanted to talk to him downstairs. So he walked downstairs, still a bit bleary-eyed, and found a woman asking if she could stay. He said, why not? And they went upstairs. Later, Diane introduced herself as a naked woman, and they had a sexual relationship while she was hiding out. Four days after Diane's escape, detectives returned to the prison to see Diane's belongings, which included clothes, a map of Mexico, and stationery for writing letters. The stationery was blank, but there were indentations when they looked at it in a certain way. The map had a line from top to bottom, which they believed was State Street, the road where the prison was located. On the bottom was the prison, and on the top was Cypher's address. Cypher wasn't at home when the authorities raided his house looking for Diane. But 40 officers stormed the house and forced themselves into his bedroom, where Diane Downs was apprehended. She was about to get a gun and just shoot herself, but she put it down and went without a fight. Cypher knew the police would eventually find Diane, and he decided that he would just tell the truth when it came to his time to burn. He has been asked a million times why he didn't turn her in, and he still has no answer other than his drug use. As a result, Diane received an additional five-year sentence, and is currently incarcerated in Chowchilla. After pleading guilty to hindering prosecution for harboring Diane Downs, Cypher got five years of probation and six months in a restitution center. I have spent the past 25 years trying to find answers as opposed to learning how to cut hair or repair air conditioning. Due to Downs' sentence, she could not be considered for parole until 2009. As a dangerous offender, she would have been eligible for parole every two years until she was released or died in prison. When Downs applied for parole in 2008, she reaffirmed her innocence. Over the years, Downs told you and the rest of the world that a man shot him and his children. Her story has never changed. She had her first parole hearing in 2008. Even after her convictions, Diane Downs continues to fabricate new versions of events. She also described her attackers as a bushy-haired stranger, two men wearing ski masks, drug dealers, and corrupt cops. It took three hours of interviews and 30 minutes of deliberation to deny her parole. Her second parole hearing was in 2010, and she was denied. She was supposed to have her next parole hearing in 2020, but it didn't happen. All I know is that I did not murder my children, and one year after my uncle was murdered, my children and I were attacked for no reason at all. The police said, strangers don't shoot strangers for no reason. So, I believe this had to be somebody who knew me. Danny is just crying real, real soft, so, so that sound stays in my mind. When I go to bed, I cry at night. Even now, I still cry. I dream about Cheryl, but at night, when I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That haunts me the most.